That's an announcement that we have for speakers in the audience. Good morning. Um, we will begin with the second half of the session. Um, and I have the first speaker as Constantine Miller. He's going to present um, work on the raw user X. I can request him to Okay. 
for things that uh, we should not put this in the article. Okay, only one. Why is the thought? What? Why is the thought? It's not enough already. Uh, let's see what the uh, Greek Wikipedia is doing. 9% uh, of Greek Wikipedians think that uh, believe that there are enough specifications to verify the fact. It's okay, but only 20% of them believe that this content should not be in uh, the article. Uh, you see that uh, tele uh, half of the people who said uh, uh, that it's not valid, valid, valid content, found that it, it is well cited. But some of, part of them answered that it is gossip and cheap politics, and Wikipedia should stay away from these things. Um, but we must not for, forget that uh, the topic is politics, and uh, some people uh, may be subjective. And some of them assert that they generally believe that they should, there should be no negative information in any article about any version. No negative information in any article. Tell me what you think afterwards. No negative also about Israel? Yeah, maybe. Do I know? He was leader of Germany for a while. Okay, it wasn't at school. Uh, the first question this kind of information. Uh, some Wikipedia's had uh, removed the information and started the discussion right after it was uh, added by you. And, uh, but uh, after the discussion and uh, when uh, most uh, more sources uh, were provided, uh, the information stayed. And uh, after some years, Katsanevas, through his partners, uh, tried to remove it from the article, also other negative information about it. But uh, when he couldn't, uh, he sent uh, some cease and desist letters. And, uh, but you know that the removal of content by anonymous and new users uh, is a red flag for some Wikipedians. And uh, especially if they, they are associated with the person, the actual subject. And then we saw the same guys, with the same users who were questioning the same uh, common figures are going to be re 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 reverting to it. So Katsanevas responded with uh, a lawsuit against uh, you asking for 2,000 euros and one year of jail. Uh, the real court hearing will be held in 2016 and until, until then uh, Katsanevas asked for the immediate removal of the content as a pretty minor injunction. Uh, Katsanevas uh, did not file a lawsuit against the Good Media Foundation. He filed it against the user. And uh, it was only the user who, put, uh, who was the first to put the information. The information was later removed and other users put it again. But he is not like, against them. Uh, we believe that it's, uh, and it's viewed in our way of defense, that uh, we need to show that the, the user view, only one user view is not controlling the article. And uh, if he wanted to remove the information from something like he, he doesn't want to do it, he cannot do it. The information is still uh, regarded as valid on topic and verifiable, and uh, no one can remove it without consensus. Uh, the view was offered uh, by the Media Foundation Assistance through its uh, Lead of Peace Assistance Program. Uh, they're paying for the uh, At first, uh, the judge called uh, Katsanevas and the Duke's lawyers to his office and uh, because Akhazanevas had, had asked for a pre preliminary order to remove the offending section. Well, that is not a decision by the judge, it's a temporary order. And uh, indeed, the judge ordered the EU to remove the comment. And it was our time to present our case. The EU removed uh, the content from the article about 10 times, uh, mentioning in the summary that uh, he is complying to the judge's order. 
and another 10 times he was reverted by other users. Uh, uh, this could be done because I have uh, already said that the judge asked uh, from Dill himself and not from anybody else to remove the content. Uh, after that, Dill uh, was blocked for, from editing for 24 hours for removing content. Uh, we expected that uh, the judge's decision after the hearing would be announced by now. We expected it since uh, May or June, but uh, the judge did not uh, present any decisions for any uh, trials he had a long, a long time ago. And, uh, it's certain that if we had a decision, uh, we would have uh, more and uh, different questions and answers. Uh, but uh, while we wait for the decision, uh, we can look upon the results in the world of Wikipedia now to Wikipedia. Uh, here I have the opinions of uh, Wikipedians about the result of the lawsuit. Uh, we can see that while most Wikipedians believe that the content is valid and properly cited, only 55% 55% believe that uh, Greek justice will uh, justify you and declare that this content is valid. And from the rest, 37% believe that while the court's uh, decision will demand the removal of content, uh, at least Wikipedia will not be affected by this. The information will stay. Uh, I remind you that 80% that, that believe that the content should, should be in the case. They're just not trusting the justice system. The justice system. So, uh, when do, do we finally act as a community? When I speak about reaction, I mean something that would uh, go out of the wiki and uh, that would help you and that would uh, inform the public about uh, the case and our point of view. Uh, we really did it late, only one day before the hearing for the preliminary minor order and about one month before the hearing for the, for the preliminary minor injunction. Uh, for most of our, of our asks, actions, we were asking Dio if he thought that it would be all right and, or it would uh, bring him in a difficult position in front of the court. Uh, first, I had written a post in my personal blog uh, that it was uh, distributed through the semi-official Facebook page of Greek Wikipedia. And soon other bloggers and uh, journalists found it and started writing about it. And then we created a page in Wikipedia, we put a banner to give visitors to it, and then we had a blog post uh, in the Foundation's uh, blog, uh, from myself also, that also was uh, also linked from the Facebook page and uh, our landing page in Wikipedia. The media had uh, already cast the story and published articles uh, about it, using information that we provided and in, uh, interviews from Casanellas and Dio. And uh, we started with uh, an information page for the community and the, the public, which uh, quickly evolved as uh, the vulnerable community, a whole uh, activity. Our message uh, was uh, centered uh, around the face we are all user due, showing the support of each one of uh, the users, saying that I'm also user due, please, uh, I stand uh, beside you. But, uh, we saw that they are not already everybody in this. Uh, the, story, the page started with a copy of my blog post. It, it was intended to keep it simple with only informative content. Uh, but in a wiki style, soon after its creation, I think minutes after, users started to put signatures of support and comments on the same page, on, not on a top page. Uh, that created some problems with the other. Uh, we later put the foundation's around, uh, announcement and uh, sections with links to new stories and other sites. Uh, the fact that users started uh, putting signatures below the message was risky. Uh, but if we could not show large support, who could uh, take our message seriously if uh, we had only 10 or 30 users uh, signing uh, below the message? In fact, many of uh, the signatures were from anonymous or usual users, and uh, even uh, from Italian Wikipedia. Any Italians uh, in this room? No. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, another problem is the fact that some users want it to seem like that they support, but they also have different views. In fact, conflicting uh, with some parts of uh, our message. Uh, so they were leaving comments, which although rare, they were prominent among the single signatures of full support. Also, some people, with peers or not, want to differentiate and show their non-supporting stance. Uh, what do we do with non-supporters? Uh, we leave it on the page or move them somewhere else. Uh, boldly, someone uh, moved uh, all of this to a top page. Uh, I believe that excessive comments, uh, supportive or not, uh, should have been removed from the main page. And probably avoiding signatures of support or non-support should be avoided and moved to some pages. And finally, the page grew up so much that some page sections uh, have little reason to remain on the page. Uh, this is the second banner we had on the wiki, and uh, here is something interesting. Uh, we don't usually put banners in uh, Greek Wikipedia. In fact, it was uh, years ago when we had used some banners, and a discussion on using some banners to promote editing and uh, outreach activities before one year became a framework with some users asking not to use any banners at all because they seem like other advertisements. Uh, this time what we did not have any discussion, we were bold and put them there and no one complained. Uh, these are the page lists for uh, the landing page and most of them uh, were on the days we had banners. Uh, the, gap, the gap is on the day that we have uh, removed the banner and we made sure that the second banner was different from the first one so that visitors would understand that there was an update on the situation. And some nice thing. Uh, Italian Wikipedia also put a banner on our case and let so many people on uh, the land page uh, translate it to Italian. Uh, Italian visi uh, visitors were more than the Greek ones. Uh, still no Italian in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we made the, our message prominent and inf informed many people and we have a clear example of this present effect. Uh, the article in Greek Wikipedia about Theodore Katsanevos was visited no more than 200 times per month. Uh, for about four years, and until making public the part of, of the lawsuit. When we announced all of this, the article was viewed by more than 30,000 people in only two days. And uh, if only a little number of people knew about the same family before, there were thousands of people after that. And there was not any article in any other Wikipedia, including in English Wikipedia. And after the foundation's uh, blog post, uh, we saw an increasing number of Wikipedia articles in many languages, starting with English with Wikipedia. And today there is a Wikipedia article about Katsanevas in 17 languages, every one of them mentioning the disgrace of the family. Uh, and the also that here the Wikipedia, except the German Wikipedia. Any German here? Okay, the German Wikipedia only describes the lawsuit and uh, without any more details. Are there any Europeans here? <laughs> ah. well, we are a minority. Here we see the traffic uh, of the English Wikipedia articles, it, is, uh, it was created in February. Uh, the story ran in multiple news articles, both in Greece and abroad. Here we must note that media in Greece do not usually favor Wikipedia before. And they also did it in this case. Most of the articles were uh, plain news articles and not opinion articles. And uh, while the simple facts are supporting our view, sometimes the wording uh, in some of the newspapers implied that Katsanevas had uh, won the pretty mining injunction, which he did not. Uh, there was no decision, in fact, it is only preliminary order. That's not a decision. Uh, but the comments on the news articles and uh, some uh, opinion articles in some influential news sites uh, criticize Katsanevas, and now Katsanevas, except for being known as a politician, he's also 
known as the COVID-19 Circusius Wikipedia. Uh, in my survey, survey I tried to find uh, if Wikipedia were affected by this and in what way. One of the first questions was, uh, if you were you and you had legal threats, would you insist on keeping the information in the article? And 58% answered yes, and 42% answered no. That's not, they are not always your view. Uh, of course, we don't expect uh, from users to go in jail for it, I don't know if be, yeah? I do. You know, uh, it's uh, different for uh, different people. Uh, I have three kids, <laughs> I don't like to go in jail, I don't, uh, I don't like to go in, uh, in court, I have never been uh, in court. Uh, uh, Dio is a strong man, he is uh, 21 years old. Uh, okay. And uh, if you are not afraid, why? You see the numbers there. Uh, obviously, anonymity is an asset, and uh, although it can also bring the respons response to ladies, you see that we also don't like anonymous edits, many, many of the Wikipedians. And uh, someone can be relaxed by the fact that no one can sue him if uh, they don't know his name. Uh, it was unfortunate that uh, uh, Katsanevas could find a way to find uh, the user's name because uh, he was uh, already exposed at some level. Also, uh, based on written answers, I have concluded that some of the users are more relaxed than they should, uh, should be, having money the help uh, from the foundation. Uh, contributors should be aware that litigation is a possibility and they should avoid placing themselves in situations uh, beyond their individual tolerance of risk. No one should rely on the possibility of uh, financial or other support from uh, with media or take any action with uh, expecting that they, do, they will receive some uh, support. It is probable that some user may think that his good faith edits are following Wikipedia policies or the law, uh, but uh, that would be only his point of view. He may be missing some points on, points on uh, the subject. He may be, he, he didn't do good research or he may be not having good understanding of the law. Uh, or Wikipedia policies may, may be conflicting with the law. Uh, effects on editing. So, 29% of the users said the editing was affected by this. So, they are probably, probably more careful than before. But 3% of them stopped writing biographies. 12% is not writing anything negative in biographies, even in the elucidations. That's a fear. 17% never edit uh, biographies, and they will never do it. 45% respond that they don't put anything never negative. No. Yes, don't put anything negative if they cannot sign it. That's normal thing. But uh, the first Numbers are problems. And we must find a way to balance <coughs> between the fear of users, that's controversial topics, and, which is something bad, this fear, and to prevent the responsible edits. Uh, so, effects on authors. Uh, what about, for example, giving uh, presentations and doing workshops, that is exposing people to the public. 4% uh, is not going to appear publicly, they want to stay anonymous, and 30% of them want to be part of our activities in order to inform the public and, uh, about how Wikipedia works and uh, to prevent this kind of issues in the future. But most of the users who asked in this survey, they were uh, veteran users. 25% uh, of them uh, the name was already known to others. Uh, 
So this attack on uh, Wikipedia held uh, multiple consequences. First, it is legally challenging our right to speak following Wikipedia policies. We must think about this and uh, try to balance them. Uh, second, it is an example of how the community unites against attacks to Wikipedia or Wikipedia users. We have seen that users agreed with the content of the article when uh, an outsider attacked on it. Uh, the users who were reverting the content in the start, who were remo removing, it, or removing it, answered to me that they started changing their mind when anonymous users started to uh, remove it. And they, they were uh, reverting to it. Uh, later on, they were sure that uh, the content is uh, good and valid when uh, more sources were added. Uh, but most of the support for our case has come because it was an attack from a politician against a Wikipedia. You know that Greece has problems and we don't like our politicians. Uh, what we need to check in future similar situations are check if the content is really following Wikipedia policy. Do the check with experienced users. In this case, it was following Wikipedia policy. Ask a lawyer. Of course, do not try out based on Wikipedia policies, but based on laws. And uh, so make it public soon. Making cases like this public can prevent other people to initiate legal actions. Uh, use Wikipedia as the, as the central hub of protest. And uh, having a central page is fine, but you must not expect that everything should be on one page. It is all right uh, when users want to show their support, but no one should expect that this uh, will be shown individually and prominent under community measures. Uh, designing is important, and choosing what goes well can prevent from needing to make decisions later and explain why, as for example, with moving excessive comments and non-supportive comments. Uh, but uh, we're still a community with everyone free to speak. There must be a room for, for the ones that disagree with the community consensus to challenge it. At best before the protest, so that uh, we'll be sure about the consensus. Since there will be an uh, established consensus, disagreements uh, can still be expressed uh, in a top page, but not on a page explaining the community's point of view, because there you must have uh, something bad. Uh, okay, I'm uh, out of time. But do I have any comments or questions? Okay. If uh, you wrote something uh, negative with uh, sources, suppose uh, the newspaper wrote it, why did, didn't the uh, code so was against the source? Why was it against uh, That was our question. Uh, Yes, that was uh, something uh, that we answered uh, to catch a level, that if uh, ten uh, big newspapers, mainstream newspapers, uh, was uh, writing the same thing, catch a level uh, should have filed a lawsuit against the, the newspapers and not against the Wikipedia user. So why didn't the judge wait until the lawsuit against the newspaper? Uh, he will not. No, he didn't, and he will not, never uh, go against the newspapers. I think the media ju is just voting. Uh, right. You are you are right, and this is what uh, the lawyers said on the court. Uh, we are the was just telling what the newspapers were telling. But as a legal strategy, anyone wants to do something against Wikipedia, but if they choose to sue the weakest possible party. Why would they want to sue a powerful newspaper? So we always will have to protect the weakest people in our community. Uh, yeah, Casanevas, uh, before some years, had uh, filed a lawsuit against uh, some journalists for uh, something similar, and he had won, but there, yeah, that was a different case. Uh, he never challenged the validity of uh, the will of uh, Andreas Papandreou that uh, was writing this all things, and uh, he never. Uh, should the uh, people for writing that the will was writing this and that. Yeah, yeah. okay. Where are they? No Italians here? No? We've got them too. Why is it?
make sense of the lab up. Um, I have Jay Porter's um, who's going to speak about play with learning and uh, a brief introduction about Jay. He's a dedicated creative entrepreneur who loves to use he's an active of mine and communication skills to have one and community to achieve their goals. He actually helps writers and research publishers um, who do better research about their articles before posting them on Hello. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jake Wolowitz. I'm user of Kasi, and uh, I've been editing for about seven years, and about two or three years into the process, I started feeling like, gosh, it really sucks to be an editor in this community. It's really challenging. It's really hard. And I had learned a lot about how to be successful, and I just felt like maybe I can save some people the trouble of uh, the difficulties that, that I face. Maybe I can make it easier for the next crop of new editors. So I'm going to tell you about an experiment that, uh, that we ran in the past year, which was one way to make things easier for, new, for newcomers to our community. Um, I based my research, and this is really key to the notion of, of games as I studied them, that the best way to approach a community is to learn what motivates them already. If you want to engage a community, you should start with what already drives them. Um, and so this research actually came from Stephen Walling and Mariana Pinchuk at the Wikimedia Foundation. These are some of the reasons that very experienced editors who have succeeded in our community said, this is why I stay. This is why I kind of put up with all the difficulties and this is what motivates me. And it was things like, like autonomy, the fact that we get to choose what we do and for the most part, no one tells us what to do or not to. You know, there's some constraints, but uh, editors get to work in areas of their personal interest. Uh, they get a sense of mastery from from chat from some of the challenges, some of the difficulties they're actually motivating because you have to overcome them. Um, and other interesting motivations like the sense of recognition from both your peers and also from uh, the public, the notion that you have this massive audience when you edit. Um, and, and then other motivations like perfectionism, like just obsessive need to fix something that's wrong and not being able to stop it when you're done. Um, or just because you love expressing yourself online. And in a weird way, even though Wikipedia has no point of view and no personal opinions on its editors, it is a form of expression. Um, and then lastly, uh, a mix of both joy or responsibility. A feeling like this is really fun to do uh, and or this is something that is that needs protecting. And so these are the motivations of the successful editors, the ones who have made it. But the challenge, of course, is that for new editors, uh, they are very distant from those motivations. The experience of a new editor is one of just overwhelming technical, social, and policy hurdles in a very complex and unguided environment. You're met by sometimes rude people who bite the newbies or bots who give you template warnings. Uh, you might find yourself very quickly in intense and contentious debates, which are both public and impersonal. And on the whole, it makes the experience of a newcomer feel complicated and inaccessible uh, and intimidating. And we know, this is the kind of the big problem, is we know that this, at, at least on English Wikipedia, this is, um, this is what we see, a decline over time in the number of active editors. Um, and so if you dig a little deeper and you kind of look at motivation, the other side of it, of course, is demotivation. What is it that makes people not want to edit? And this comes from survey research uh, that Sue Gardner did actually about female editors, but I think that it's uh, very broadly applicable, that Wikipedia is confusing, can feel threatening. Uh, it's kind of isolated work. There's not a lot of social interaction. Uh, it's very time consuming. Um, and it's unpredictable. You, have, you don't have a sense that your efforts will necessarily amount to anything. So a couple uh, years back, um, I started following the work of the Tea House, which is a new editor community, a 
kind of a, a very friendly and supportive uh, help desk on English Wikipedia that, that started to get me thinking that what we need to do is introduce some new strategies in the community. Um, and, and over the, the, those couple of years, we thought of four strategies um, that make a difference in how people feel in our community. And the first strategy, if you want to attract newcomers, uh, is invitation. This notion that some people simply will not jump in unless you ask them. You need to go out and reach people and say, come, come with us, work with us, join us. Um, and when people are invited, they feel welcome, they feel supported, and it starts to plant the seed of a sense of belonging. Uh, the next strategy that we saw both in Tea House and in experiments with badges uh, from prior uh, work with Barn Stars on Wikipedia is that acknowledgement is really powerful. Um, that when you're recognized for doing something well, it validates you, and it makes you want to do more of it. It encourages you to engage. Um, and uh, maybe least recognized, when someone praises you, it, it builds a sense of connection with that person. You know, it's, exchange, it's an exchange of peer recognition that's really powerful. The third strategy is something that's very foreign to our community, which is showing off people. Um, you know, the Tea House was one of the first communities to highlight profiles where people could put up their own pictures. It wasn't required, it was encouraged, um, because seeing faces gives people a sense of community. Uh, and particularly, particularly for editors who might not naturally see themselves as part of Wikipedia, uh, seeing faces of people who look like them might encourage them to join a community that otherwise they would have felt was not for them. Um, and just in terms of uh, social psychology, uh, seeing faces, seeing people reminds you uh, that we're all human and working together. And I, I, I bet many of you have had an experience where you met someone online who was somewhat hostile or seemed kind of like a jerk or had no sense of humor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in person at this conference, maybe they seem reasonable and you can talk about your differences or at least understand each other. Um, so showing people is really important. And all those, uh, those three strategies inform uh, the work that I wanted to do, but I wanted to try something different um, because what was my interest was this notion that human connection is great, but we need more than just human connection in order to get started with something new. Uh, when something is scary and intimidating, we need to overcome that with something that's more, more empowering. And for me, that, that is play. Uh, this notion that when you're doing something and you're learning and it's fun, the fear of failure goes down. The sense of intimidation goes down. The resistance to trying things where you're going to make mistakes goes down. And ultimately, even though Wikipedia is a very important, globally meaningful project, um, play can help us do serious things uh, because we enjoy them more. There's no harm. There's not, nothing wrong about having fun. It's not a conflict with doing something important. And this led me to research about this emerging field of gamification. I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's a simple idea that people love to play games, and games are really about being motivated towards some goal, and maybe we can borrow some of the elements from games and apply them to our community. I don't know if you heard Ralph Koster's talk, but he was looking at Wikipedia as a game and wondering, like, OK, this, let's assume this is a game. But it's kind of a broken game in a lot of ways. Um, and so what I did is I looked at the community and I thought, well, if games are motivating and there's all this research on how games help people uh, to do great things, even if some of them are just virtual or without you know, serious purpose, um, are there ways in which our community is somewhat like a game that we maybe don't acknowledge? And looking around, I think there definitely are a lot of elements in our community that we don't necessarily recognize as games, but game designers certainly would. For example, we have an edit count leaderboard. And for some people, this is very motivating to see yourself at the top or rising up this edit count leaderboard. For some, that's, that's a signal that you're succeeding in making progress. Um, on English Wikipedia, at least, if you write a good or featured article, you might earn this sticker that this badge or of sorts that says, this is what I have accomplished. These are all of the good and featured articles I've written. And display that proudly as a, a symbol of your accomplishments, which is something that games do often. Um, although we discourage hack collecting in our community, uh, there are lots of different user rights, powers that you can gain as a user 
which allow you to do more things, whether it's renaming files or blocking other editors. And this is just a graph of the different kinds of user rights that you have, you know, yeah. culminating in administrator or ARBCOM or you know, bureaucrat or steward. There are things that, that you can, there are powers that you can earn because you establish trust in the community. And we have these. Um, we also have some things that are just outright contests, like the Wiki Cup, you know, article writing contests. Um, and we have backup cleanup drives. You know, we don't just clean up lots of, you know, there might not be a, it's not just go copy edit something, it's we will have a copy edit drive. You know, there's this, this sense of, of, of an intentional gathering towards a goal that people are working on and they're charting their progress. This is actually for military history, they were trying to get you know, a certain percentage of their articles up to B class. Um, and the article, rank, art, article quality rankings themselves are an element that is somewhat game like This notion that, you know, in a game you would level up uh, your powers in World of Warcraft. Well, you know, on Wikipedia, maybe you're leveling up your article. Um, you know, you're taking it from a stub and you're raising it to a good article or a featured article status. And that sense of level and progression is really important in games, and we have it. Um, and then obviously barn stars, you know. Barn stars are like the purest form of, of a, a reward that you get from your peers. Um, maybe more powerful than, uh, you know, the, the badges you get in the game because they're given by another, another person who respects you. So I wanted to take these elements uh, or kind of play with this notion that games already are in our community and are motivated and do something totally experimental with them and ask like, can we use what's good about games to make it easy for people to join our community and to edit in our community? So we started this project called the Wikipedia Adventure. And it's an experiment in gamified onboarding, gamified bringing people into the community. And it's a, it takes about an hour to play. Uh, it's an interactive journey through Wikipedia that teaches the basic editing, social, and policy skills that you would need to have a successful First 100 edits was my goal. Make those first 100 edits instead of frustrating, uh, exciting, and empowering. And so I do a lot of research about how you design games. I'm not a game designer. But this notion that games can create a culture of learning, uh, that if you design them well, games can build a sense of identity, uh, that if a game is well designed, it can make uh, an experience that otherwise would feel complicated seem uh, usable or user friendly. <clears throat> And then uh, on a deeper level, the games can really help inspire a sense of communal wisdom, um, encourage play, and allow people to get in a frame of mind where they're capable of change and growth. And uh, the takeaway from all of this game design research tracks back to that first slide, which was when you're designing games in serious communities, don't just layer stickers and points or dollars or giveaways on top of it leverage the really deep, intrinsic motivations of the community and just amplify them. So it took about a year uh, of writing the, the game, coding the game. We used the Guided Tours extension, which the uh, Media Foundation developed. Um, and then we had an awesome month of alpha test bug fixing where the community just reported hundreds of bugs. And, uh, and then we ran, ran some metrics. Um, this is just a world cloud, word cloud of the script, you know, planet, people, relevant, quests, awesome, fun. Uh, we were trying to, to capture some, some of the spirit of adventure. And we started really early with just a simple prototype, you know, something that looked like this, like, okay, what would it be like if when you came to Wikipedia, someone was there to guide you around and, and walk you through it? And uh, that was designed by user Sonia uh, three years ago. And we had an, an image in mind for how we wanted the game to feel. And this was important from a design perspective. And we wanted the game to, to have this sense that someone was going to reach out and grab you and pull you up on this adventure. And so this was kind of the image that I wanted to keep in mind through the tone of the game. And I thought, at the end of the game, I want it to feel like this. I want you to feel like you've accomplished something great, and you're looking out at this awesome vista. You know? So those were powerful motivators for me as a designer. And other images, you know, thinking about the, the scale of the universe and, you know, stars spinning in the sky and a solar patchwork and this phrase that we came up with, the, that Wikipedia is about the galactic carnival of humanity. 
just this wacky gathering of people who are all working together towards this absolutely incredible goal. And so uh, I worked with an amazingly talented designer who the foundation luckily uh, has on staff named Heather Walls. And, and she built this game that, that kind of has a sense of whimsy uh, that is designed to feel warm and inviting. You know, designing a game uh, about adventures in space, you know, we were careful. We didn't want it to have too sci-fi of a feel. We wanted it to be broadly appealing and really just celebratory and fun. So we've got galactic fireworks. We've got your galactic guide, Phil O. Sophie. That's Phil O. Sophie. Um, and, and this is some of the elements of the games. You have uh, guided tours. You have these elements that walk you through the game and tell you about, like, okay, here's your, here's your talk page. Here's your watch list. Here's what these things are. And it's neat. The guided tours feature can attach to different elements on the page. Um, you know, and it can walk you through an adventure. And each of the different missions kind of has a theme and a goal. Uh, and you learn things and along the way. You're challenged with questions. And if you answer a question right, you might encounter uh, some fun special effects that we pull, you know, some media files that we pull from commons. Um, there are, are simulated editing interactions. We use the API and a little bit of magic here so that as you advance through the tour, it feels like people are actually talking to you. Someone comes to you and invites you on this adventure to edit the article on Earth. Uh, and as you go through this process of fixing typos and adding sources and doing research, you also encounter some people who tag your work as you know, unsighted or not referenced, and you have to dialogue with them. Uh, and it's all, it's all simulated. This all happens in your user space. So there's no actual risk. It's, it's very safe play, which is probably, um, I think, what distinguishes a game from anything else is that element of safe, safety to experiment. Um, and there's silly stuff, there's, um, there's sound effects, there's a crying unicorn with pink tears and crashing rockets um, if you get questions wrong. You know, just because you can learn from failure, and failure, sh failure should have an element of fun too. And throughout the game, there's just oodles. We just wanted to like slam people in the face with positive reinforcement, just over and over again. Just to overcome the sense of fear that people have in this community. So there's barn stars and there's wiki love, and you can see your statistics of your editing skills just kind of growing and growing. Um, and just constantly telling people you're doing great, keep it up, which is not something that you can get often as a newcomer in our community. And then of course there are badges, because it's this this was a, a gamified experiment. The one tweak that we made to badges is we didn't just do badges for skills, you know. Uh, we didn't want you to get um, uh, the, um, the Wikilink badge, for example, uh, as you know, that you can do a Wikilink, but we call it the Wikilinker badge. And we're trying to encourage a sense of people feeling like, I am a person who has this skill. This is now part of my identity. Um, and when you've done the game, you have actually created an article that looks pretty awesome. You know, it would, it would be a, a good quality article on simple English. We had to just tone it down a little bit. Um, and it has beautiful pictures, and, and it, just, it just looks nice. It feels like you actually created something. and gives people just a glimpse of what it would be like to create a great article on Wikipedia and feel proud of it. So how did, uh, how did this work? This was an experiment, so we ran uh, a lot of qualitative and quantitative analysis. And people really liked the game. Um, they were very satisfied with the overall experience of playing it. Just a quick question. How many here have played with Pete Adventure? Oh, wow. That's a lot. OK, awesome. And I'll give you the link to it afterwards. Um, yeah, and editors who played uh, said that they felt more confident. They understood Wikipedia better. They wanted to edit more. They knew what to do next. They felt prepared. Uh, and they enjoyed playing it. You know, 70 to 90 percent uh, felt like that. A couple quick quotes. Uh, some said that they liked that it involved actual editing rather than just theory or reading. Uh, they liked that it kind of pulled back the curtain on uh, uh, the mysterious, sometimes opaque uh, process of Wikipedia. That it was a good stepping stone. And you know, my my personal most most heartwarming quote that this was the best example of gamification that I've ever witnessed. And that was like, yeah, win. But then my second favorite quote is that this is a game for idiots entertained by drivel. <laughs> <laughs> and 
uh, and, and it's really important that I, that I include this because the first four quotes came from editors who had made under 100 edits. And the last quote came from an editor who had made 100,000 edits. <laughs> and it confirmed for me that when you design something, you need to know your target audience. And our target audience was new editors with open minds. It was not people who had been so hardened that they would be insulted by the notion that learning and having an easy stepping stone to this community could be fun. So I'm glad, I, I take it as a sign of pride that someone uh, who was that experienced thought that this game was somewhat trivial, because to me it meant that we were doing something right, that the game was fun enough to actually be different and overcome some of the challenges in a new way. Uh, we specifically asked about the gamified elements. You know, this could have been a more straightforward tour. The theme could have been libraries rather than space. And editors like the gamification elements. They would not have wanted it to be more straightforward. And, uh, and we hit our target demographic. Again, with, with designing something, we want to kind of have a user in mind. And our user uh, demographic, we were aiming for college-age men and women. Uh, and so we, we hit that pretty right on, but also with kind of a nice distribution as if this game would be suitable for, for all ages. And we have heard uh, retirees and also uh, middle school students say that this game was, was playable to them. The age of three to I'm sorry? The age of three. Yeah, that's three to 12. <laughs> that doesn't mean that there was someone, it was just a bucketed category. It could have been a 12 year old, we just kind of grouped it by, yeah. Um, but yeah, there was a, I did watch a, I did watch a seven-year-old girl play this game with her father, and she thought it was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, quantitatively, what did we see? Um, you know, we looked, we obviously want to encourage people to edit more. When we looked, uh, we designed a qualitative, quantitative test. We looked at a control group of editors who didn't play the game a group of editors who were invited to play but didn't play, and then the group that were invited to play and did play. And so, you know, average edits, uh, those who were invited to play and did play ended up making about 20% more edits over six months uh, than those in the control group. So there, there was, um, there was some, some increase in, in raw editing. Um, we also saw a difference between those who ended up finishing the game versus those who just started it. Those who finished the game ended up making about 40% more edits over the course of six months. A neat finding is that uh, among the uh, invited players of the game, uh, they made about two, twice as many talk page edits over the course of six months. So maybe this game was kind of encouraging some social interaction. Um, but I have to kind of give a qualification to the analysis. Um, because it depends how you cut the numbers statistically. If you look at the game itself as our intervention, um, then we see those positive numbers. 20% more edits, 200% more uh, talk page edits. But we can't guarantee that that's not from some self-selection bias of who chose to play the game. You know, when you look at just sending out the invite itself as the intervention that we were making, then there's no clear effect. So there's kind of room for, for reflection, and there's also, uh, there's also a, a theory that we're, we're leading to here. So first of all, this, this was innovative and experiment. We're trying something new, and we definitely learned uh, from that. It was a good experience, learning for me and also for, for the players. They really gave us great qualitative feedback about the game. Um, the numbers are ambiguous about the quantitative effects, but there's one really interesting uh, thing that we want to explore. We noticed that uh, the variance, the range of kind of activity amongst those who played the game was much, like 10 times as wide as those who in the control group. And so variance is, is about your distribution. The lowest you can go is zero. Uh, if the variance in the, the group who played is 10 times as high, it means some of those editors who played the game ended up wait, making way more edits, like super editor levels of edits. Uh, and so, so there's a theory that maybe what's going on in this game is that it's sending some editors into a safe experimental place where they end up leaving the community after they play the game. It satisfies their curiosity. They weren't really into it, but at least they learned something. 
Uh, what we want to test is that maybe this game is actually helping kind of catapult and accelerate those who are going to go on to be really prolific in the community. Um, and so what we're left with is a tool, uh, a new model, and the notion that uh, maybe play can lead to deeper, more fun engagement in the community. Have to give uh, quick shout outs to the team that designed this. Heather Walls was the designer, Siko Bowders was the project supervisor, Nishay Nahata coded the interactions, Matt Flashin at WMF gave us all the technical advice we needed, and Jonathan Morgan, who is here, uh, helped us design all of our impact analysis and assessment. Um, so the question, what's next? Um, we want to see, the, over a longer term, with more editors, does this impact retention? You know? It, People like playing the game, ultimately we want to see that it leads them to stay with us and do more. Uh, we need to integrate it with other new editor tools like the Tea House or uh, a new mentorship space that we're designing and see where it fits because this might work for some but not others. Um, there's also about five different communities, uh, non-English communities, that have asked to localize the game and translate it into their language. So that's uh, it can be. I haven't had time to. Yeah, yeah, it's neat. Catalan is doing it and they changed the theme a little bit. It's, you know, the code is totally transferable and you can take it and, and spin it however you want. And just the last notion is, is something that I think a lot of people are talking about is um, games are really a great way to get people to contribute. Um, maybe we can make some games that actually let people edit, not just learn how to uh, to edit, but, but make some edits. Like the Wikidata game is this awesome example, and maybe we can do that for some micro contributions on Wikipedia. All right, that's all I got. I'll take a couple questions, and the game is at uh, WPTWA. That's a, just a URL short here, so enwp.org slash WP colon TWA. And uh, yeah, any questions? No, I have a question. Uh, how did you uh, choose your control group. I mean, I understand or they are, were already all editing uh, and you divide them in two. Some of them they were like, would like to play, others didn't want, or uh, were there potential editors, or how did you choose your control group? And what, what, what were they really? Okay, uh, I'm gonna let uh, the, the data analyst answer that question. Jonathan Morgan is here. So uh, we, uh, ran a daily query of new editors who made at least um, five edits and hadn't been blocked or banned and hadn't received a level four warning. Okay. okay. Um, and then we uh, took a random subset of those and said we aren't going to invite those people to play the game uh, and the rest of them are going to play the game. You invited them and um, some of them said, okay, we would like to continue and play games and the others were the control group. So there was a non-invited control group, which is, our, which is our baseline control. They were not invited and they didn't play. And then there was a set of people who were invited to play, some of whom. Oh, played. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on micro contributors, I have several suggestions if you like. So there can be editing capsule for micro editing, taster and appetizers, bite size editing, or editing test. So to lure people and encourage, look, you, you have even if you have 15 minutes, at least you can contribute one thing. Yes. Keeps on adding stars. Absolutely. And we actually wrote up an idea on the Idea Lab about this, and I would love to show you the link so you can add some of your, your ideas to that page. My follow-up question is, are you thinking something for the reader's experience? Uh, so, so far, no. A reader's dashboard that encourages reader to tailor and form uh, their what they want to explore and gain from the experience. It's a neat idea. My focus is on editor engagement, but I think that there's a whole other story. So if there is someone on the team, I have more ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, Last question? Yeah, so uh, one of the major components of this is uh, a lot of positive reinforcement along the way in the Wikipedia venture. Uh, my question is, is, as a result, did you see new users coming out of that program um, giving positive reinforcement by other editors as a consequence, sort of this uh, contagion of... Uh, yeah, the question was, uh, did all of the positive reinforcement in, in the game lead to the editors giving more positive reinforcement once they enter the community? Uh, we didn't analyze it. Okay. Um, but, you know, we have the editors' names, we could look at something. 
Uh, certainly. And um, I'll, uh, I'll stay around in the back after uh, the next talk if anyone wants to ask questions. Thank you.
we're, we're moving towards uh, getting mobile support going. Um, and also, it turns out even for modern browsers, this is still a problem. I mean, if you start with IE6, like, we're, it does not look on IE6. Um, but even in modern browsers, there's a lot of huge differences, even at this, even at this point in time. And um, they don't really seem to agree on how standards should be done, at least not when you get down to the degree details. And uh, we sort of demand that a little rigor. Uh, but also, yes, wiki text is a huge issue for us. Um, there's a lot of ambiguities, there's a lot of limitations, there's a lot of design flaws, and they bubble up into the user interface, and users get really confused about what's going on because um, it doesn't quite work the way Microsoft Word works, mostly because wiki text is not the same as Microsoft Word. Uh, it's data format. And so we have to work really hard just to maintain compatibility. And um, isn't that so sad? Uh, but we, uh, we're really hoping to share some of these experiences with you, not necessarily to whine and cry, but um, <laughs> because we think that there are some interesting challenges that we, most of which we've overcome, and there's some kind of uh, exciting stories to tell. And so to tell the first one, I'm going to switch over to Roby Tao, who's going to talk to us about Wikipedia. All right, so, where are you? Where are you? So let's talk about Wikitex. Um, Wikitex, as Trevor said, is a limiting factor for us. Um, and one of the main problems is that if you're a visual editor user, if you're like a visual editor only user, then as far as you're concerned, Wikitex does not exist. Like it is our job and our goal to pretend to these people that Wikitex has never been there and will never be there and they can sort of live in a standard land where they don't have to deal with it. Which we're, which we're succeeding in for the most part, and that's a lot of the goal. But the, the reality is we can text so neat there. And users may want to do things that we, you can't do nicely or can't do at all in text. And so it ends up being that we text limits the users and what they can do. We can't let them do things that are not representable in text or that produce very ugly weak text because people get upset, which means that certain things are not allowed, but they're totally arbitrary. And as a user, you don't know why, because you don't know about wiki text, and so you don't know about these completely random limitations. So um, I'll show a few examples of like headaches we've had in that in that category. Um, so um, in wiki text, you can do nested lists, and you can do this perfectly well in HTML as well. It's uh, it's perfectly normal. It's the way that HTML wants you to do it is kind of weird, where it wants you to nest the second level list. At the end of the first, at the end of the previous list item, um, which is a little weird, but whatever, fine. That's how everyone does it. Um, if you insert a line break there um, after after nested list and you don't put a put a star there, then it ends the list completely, and your 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 bar ends up completely outside of the list. That's also fine, but if you wanted to put Text, before, text after the nested list, but within the same list item. Um, so you have a list item that contains foo, and then a nested list, and then bar. You can't do that in text. It's perfectly valid HTML. It's, some, it's something that initially would almost not have to happen if you did certain things in Visual Editor, like press enter, which the year is fairly common. Um, but you can't do it in text. And so we take all sorts of pains to not let you do this, because it creates nightmares, but this is of course, it's completely non-transparent to anyone. Anyway. Um, and in general, we tend to ignore that new line characters exist. Um, you also can't really use preformatted text in lists. I mean, with text lets you do it if you use an HTML tag there, but uh, and that actually works just fine. But you, it doesn't really work, or it's, and it's not really useful because you try to do this which you wouldn't be using a pre-tag if you didn't care about the way the new lines were treated, so you're probably going to have a new line in there. Then it happily breaks your list for you and throws bar outside of the list into its own paragraph, because clearly that's what you meant, because clearly no one's ever going to have a new line inside the list. Um, this is super evil. Um, it also shows you how sort of this, this whole notion of using HTML some places in wiki text doesn't really work, but HTML wiki text don't really get along that well. And um, obviously, this means that if you have preformatted text in a list and you try to press enter in it, then Visual Editor needs to do, well, not that, because that doesn't work. And if you try to create, um, if you try to create this HTML here, oops, 
Just keep pressing buttons. <laughs> yeah, just keep pressing buttons. That's what uh, I hear this talk about. Um, so if you try to create um, something like this, like if your user tried to press enter inside of the preformed text on list, this is what you would probably expect to happen, except that it's completely impossible to write root text that does that. So we, maybe we should let you do that. And um, so instead what happens is if you press enter inside of the list item, then it's list the list item. We'll never try to insert any sort of line break like thing there because we know that it explodes. Um, and also if you select text in the list and try to make it preformatted, we break out of the list because we know that preformatted text in the list is making trouble. But um, of course it only makes sense if you're us and you've dealt with this pain. And if you're the user, this makes no sense whatsoever. Um, you can also, if you continue to use line breaks inside of list, you can also do this in Wikitext, and it will um, do what you expect. It will create a paragraph break in your list item. Um, this isn't the most beautiful Wikitext of all time, but it kind of works. Um, you, um, sorry for that. I, I think I should have buttons to mention that. Um, this works. It's not very beautiful. Um, this is basically what you would what you would get if we let you if we let enter in list items work in a normal way in a certain paragraph break. Um, and so obviously the solution is to not let you just create paragraphs break in, in list items, and they have no idea why. Um, one of my favorite examples is um, uh, image only syntax and we can text. It's so amazing. Um, you would think that you could totally embed an image inside of the text of the link. So what this is trying to do is it's trying to create a link to page with the link text being foo, an image, and a follower. Um, this seems reasonable. You can totally do this in HTML. You can totally have an image that's like part of a link caption. If you try to do this in weak text, then everything freaks out. And it decides the image is more important than the link, and it just barks a bunch of weak text all over the page. Um, so you know, if we try, if we let you try to create a link across an image, then it would try to generate a text like that, which then if you render it back would create this garbage. And so we can let you do that. And if you try to link across an image, it will silently cut the link of the image and then continue it afterwards because we know that links and images are trouble. Um, <coughs> users have no idea. Um, so yes, and so if you wanted to do this, this is completely sensible HTML. You should totally be able to do this in the visual editor, except we don't let you because if you then try to put the link text in back, it will be completely negative. Um, so those were things that were just broken in <coughs> things that you can't do in Wikitext. There are also things that you can kind of do in Wikitext, except the result is so ugly that um, we, the people that do use Wikitext yell at us whenever we do it. And so we also try to nudge you the way from that. Um, one of these things is um, if you, um, uh, is with links. So um, this is um, the feature in Wikitext where you have link trails. So if you try to create um, a link to foo followed by the word bar, you would think that you would write it like that. But in fact, that doesn't actually work that way because um, Wikitext is helpful and does link trailing, where if you write text after a link, it automatically um, moves it into the link. So if you try to do the conversion like on the first line, it would actually break on you because if you then try to convert it back to HTML, you'd get something different. And it would actually go and help you and put bar on the link, which is not what you did. What you did. And so instead, we have to use a no-wiki tag, and people start crying and yelling at us for inserting no-wikis all over the place. Um, <coughs> the, the solution to this problem, if you can call it that, is to, um, when users type text at the end of the link, try and make sure that, that by default that that text is always part of the link. And so you try and nudge them into creating content that looks like the thing on the second line, which works, and try to make it harder for them to create content that looks like the thing on the third line, because we know that's covered. Um, this kind of behavior steering is kind of like, it sort of promotes harmony because visual editor users end up creating weak text that doesn't look hideous and people are upset about. But, you know, it's, uh, it's not a real solution and it's completely untransparent to, to people who use it. Um, you can also um, put spaces at the beginning of um, paragraphs really easy in visual editor um, by pressing the space bar. Um, you would think that we would just generate weak text for the space at the beginning. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way because the space at the beginning is meaningful. It means you're typing a pre-tag. 
And um, so what we actually have to do is wrap this space in a no weak tag. And again, people get upset at us because no weak tags are ugly. And we haven't even solved this problem yet. Um, we think that we might want to just like detect these spaces in problematic places and just deliberately ignore them and throw them away. Um, but you know, even if we do that, that's not a real solution to the problem. It's just like trying to steer around various um, pitfalls here. So here's another example: is you can um, you can type hash three like the number three, and then also you can try to vaguely serialize that as what you expect because hash means that you're trying to do a number list. Um, and so you have to grab the hash in the wiki, um, which again we try and discourage people from doing this by going like, well, what you type what well, looks like wiki text this won't really work, or surely you want to do this. Um, which a more sort of recent example of that would be, whoops, I don't know what this doesn't mean. Just keep mashing buttons. Just keep mashing buttons. Um, a more recent example of this would be this, where if the user actually tries to type wiki text in the visual editor, we come up with like a big flash of warning saying this won't work the way that you expected that it would. And if you do it, if you do say that you actually have like a weak tags, we can't really prevent that because this is what we have to do to give a faithful representation of what they typed. So instead we just surface a warning and go like, well, people will probably not like it to do this, but we can't really stop that. Um, we have also considered um, convert just automatically converting this to the link, but we're you know we're trying to we kind of like Wikitext doesn't exist, so that would be incredibly confusing for people that have never used Wikitext and they, they match the buttons and all of a sudden they have a link and they have no idea why. So I've talked about like solutions to these kinds of problems, and these are just a few examples. There are like a lot of other things that we steer around, but they're not really solutions. They're like solution inputs because they're just like the lesser of all evils, and we sort of try and nudge people to do what we think it's the right thing, but the reason that it's the right thing is the reason that they can even understand. So it's just a bunch of crap to work around. So it's not, it's not really in a space where we have power solutions for things. So um, now Trevor just wants to talk about browsers, which I'm sure we can all agree are lovely things. <laughs> I recommend them. <laughs> so more specifically today, I'm, only, I'm really only going to be talking about um, a browser feature known as content editable. Um, it's a very magical feature that browsers provide. Uh, probably the richest feature that they that they've ever that they've ever introduced. Um, it makes HTML like this uh, editable by simply flipping a switch. Um, job done. Let's go home now. <laughs> We're all sorted. But uh, of course, it's never the case. Uh, it turns out that of all the wonderful features that browsers have given us in the past decade or so, um, this is not one of them. Uh, content editable is really inconsistent. It's very overzealous, if you will, and it's very unreliable. Uh, you're basically always in a defensive position trying to figure out what just happened. It doesn't give you enough events. It uh, does weird things uh, based on you know what day of the week it is, which way the wind's blowing, and uh, depending on which browser you're in and what operating system you're on, it you know, basically just. Well, I think there's a math.random somewhere in there. I'm not really sure. Um, so we kind of. I uh, had this idea early on that what we do is just, let's just avoid content editable full stop. We work in a wiki editor, we try to make a syntax highlighted version of uh, wiki text editing and presented content editable, and we ran into a lot of issues. Uh, and so we just figured, you know what, let's just make a synthetic surface. This is what Google Docs says, for instance. It's, uh, yeah, it's not using content editable. All of the text selection and the blinking cursor and all of that are done with just rendering divs, and it's completely fixed. And we did it, and it worked. But uh, you know, even though we had full control, we also had a, uh, all the responsibility to implement everything from scratch, uh, and that's where we found this limitation. Uh, because things like spell check and uh, when you type on mobile, uh, pressing spacebar twice, what does it do? Um, and, you know, a different ID is what happens if you're using swipe, and uh, mobile text selection is also a big problem because it's, it works very different and it looks very different from the way it does in mobile text or desktop browsers. And so all these things started stacking up against us, and we started thinking maybe we'll have to reach the content editable because uh, we are actually quite quite limited um, in what we're, what we're able to accomplish. Um, so we realized that the reason that our content editable experience was so bad uh, was because we were making uh, the DOM the center of our application. That every everything in our application, the data was in the DOM, uh, and 
content interval is having its way with it uh, on our permission most of the time. And the view, which was content interval, was, was right there in the DOM. Uh, and of course, the controller, we're just relying on events from the DOM. And so uh, this, this put us, that's what put us in this really defensive position. And the truth is, this is the way content interval was designed to be used. So this seems sensible. Uh, but it really set us up a failure. And what we realized what we needed to do was um, come up with a different, <coughs> different architecture completely, where instead we just used Contentable for the little things that it is good for, like rendering, uh, text selection, and some, but not all, uh, input. Uh, because even, even the events that it gives sometimes are telling lies, and we pretty much have to uh, monitor it uh, repeatedly, over and over and over, and check up on it and see what it's doing. Uh, it's sort of resource intensive. So it's, this whole experience has really just taught us one thing, which is that browsers are, are dangerous. They will lie to you. They will waste your time. They are, they are bound to make you look foolish. And they're, they're toys. Using a browser to make an application on Wikipedia is like using my seven-year-old daughter's play kitchen to run a restaurant. I mean, everything seems to be there, but you gotta use your imagination. Um, and that's what I think a lot of visual editor engineering is, is um, coming up with very imaginative ways to overcome the, uh, the toy-like state of browsers, uh, at which we hit all the time. And so my recommendation to anybody doing front-end development is to protect yourself um, by abstracting. And that's exactly what we did. That's the architecture that we came up with, is to basically abstract the DOM completely um, to the point where we're really just using it as a thin uh, rendering client and some, with some info. And just to keep browsers on a very short leash and to give them a minimal amount of control. And that is my recommendation for you. And now to talk about the troubles of operating systems and how they affect our work is Ed Sanders. Hello, I'm Ed. I'm trying to model. I'm just a token British guy. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about something specifically bad about content editable, which is copy paste. Um, here's the good news. Content editable gives you copy paste. You press control C, it puts stuff in the clipboard. You press control V, it takes out the clipboard. And that's pretty much half the job done for you. We don't have to like write the data to some fake clipboard and intercept key events and all that stuff. Here's some even more good news, brought to you by Clippy. Um, it has a bunch of events that are actually quite useful. So not only are there on copy and on paste events, but they happen before the copy and before the paste. So if you, if you have the uh, on copy event fired, that means the data hasn't been written to the clipboard yet, which turns out to be really useful because um, you can actually move someone's selection just before it writes the data to the clipboard and change what goes into the clipboard. Um, even more good news, there's an API with get data and set data, so you can write stuff directly into the clipboard. Um, this is only available on copy and paste events, but we can like directly set whatever the hell we want in there um, with an asterisk, because anyone can use it here then we need to talk. OK, on to the not so good news. It's really bad. It's really inconsistent. Uh, copy paste is to content editable what content editable is to browsers. It's like, it's the worst of the worst. Um, if we're talking about Trevor's Play Kitchen, this is like using Play Doh to make a Play Kitchen to run a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> it's just every browser, there's no documentation. Every browser does it slightly differently. Um, and it may or may not change next week. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the beautiful API that will let us <coughs> whatever we want in the data in the clipboard data and take whatever we want out only works in Chrome. So uh, unfortunately, we have to support more than one browser. So we needed to come up with another method uh, that will work in Firefox and maybe even on one day. So, uh, Let's have a look at um, what we actually want to do in Visual Editor. Um, we have a couple of use cases. There's the easiest one, quote unquote, which is uh, to copy some text 
uh, the top of your document and paste it a bit lower. Um, in that case, we can actually use a fake clipboard um, because we can just sort of use the internal data that's already in our model. As Trevor mentioned, we take the model out of the content editor. We store our data in the array. So every time you get copy, you can just say, oh, you selected from one to six. And then when you, when you get paste, if it was the same thing, you can just move the data. Um, do you want to copy from one <coughs> the instance to another? But that means getting all this rich data, like templates or images, and making sure that goes into the clipboard properly. Um, and we also might want to copy like into a Word document. So we need to make sure that what goes into the Word document is actually like clean HTML. Um, so you might have thought, you know, just to copy between the instances, well, we could just take our internal data and JSON serialize it. And then if you paste that into Word, you're going to be like, oh, what, what just happened there? I copied like a paragraph and a heading, and now I've got all these belly brackets. That's what you want. And people may also want to like copy stuff from a website and paste it into the um, Probably not so much on Wikipedia, because you know, and you can flash up the copy by a little bit. So, some solutions. Number one, we have this uh, thing called PM HTML, which isn't the content editable HTML, because content editable HTML will randomly abuse your HTML. We keep a really clean copy of the DM HTML, which is what gets sent back to the server when you get saved. So we want to put that in the clipboard. Um, that has stuff like, uh, you know, if you've got a template, there's a, a table, it, it just gets rid of the table and replaces the little marker saying, this is an info box template, and you have the parameters. So if you put that in the clipboard, when you paste in another visual editor instance, you get the template, and not just the rendering of the template, which is a table and you know, a bunch of random stuff that you know, depend, depends on what skin you're using, for example. Um, and then if we can also put in the clipboard some sort of um, marker you know, for internal copy paste, so we can say, oh, this copy actually came from visual editor, then when we hit paste, we can say, well, this was a visual editor copy. Was it from the same window that we're currently in? If it is, then we can just grab the data from our internal, from some internal uh, data structure side. Mm -hmm. So, route one, you have thrown. Things get easy. We can use the event clipboard data. We put our DM HTML in uh, the HTML part of the clipboard. By the way, the clipboard has a plain text area, an HTML area, and sort of random custom metadata. And then we can stick a custom key um, pointing to some internal store for the actual internal data if they are to do another uh, the to be paste. Um, and that's not too bad. There's a few problems with actually setting the data directly, like means don't get uh, granted because they get converted, but they can work around that. And here's the hard way, which was happens when you have Firefox or Internet Explorer. You hit copy. And as we said earlier, we have really early events. So we take your selection, which is in the CE. We then make, generate some DM HTML, put it in a hidden text area, remove your selection to the text area. Then we wait a bit, wait for the, uh, wait for the uh, copy to happen, so that that gets written to the uh, clipboard. And then we put everything back where we found it. So it's a slightly complicated process. But, uh, you've seen this slide before. There's no problem. Uh, the uh, content editable clipboard has a habit of um, tweaking your HTML so it you know, looks better. And Internet Explorer does this particular throws away lots of white space. That's not so bad. Firefox, in the we need to talk again. Uh, they throw away a whole bunch of HTML attributes such as IDFA. That's quite unfortunate for us because we use RDFA to define all template metadata. So if you're in Firefox and you try to do this, you just throw away all the template metadata and you just be left with a meaningless in the scan. And the template will go. Uh, we can work around this by serializing all the templates which we think content editors will might destroy it and putting them in another template, which, another attribute which we think they won't destroy. And you have element destruction. Uh, empty spans, we use empty spans in Mozilla to store this internal template key, and then Mozilla decides to destroy it because we don't need to have an empty span now, right? So, a little hack we can do there is to add a class, and that sort of protects it at the moment. Who knows what that one is with? And reordering. If you paste in the sort of wrong, if you sort of copy maybe just a table cell, 
and try to paste that in a paragraph in my sort of bracketing tables. It might move the paragraph outside to the HTML balances. So we need to make sure that when we do do this fake uh, paste moving trick, that we sort of paste it into the right sort of context. And I think almost, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, we don't think we've got this completely sorted out. Uh, we get reports of bugs. Um, we'd love you to try and just you know find a visual editor in your browser, copy and paste and stuff. And if you can get it to break, try and get it to break again. Because um, then we can reproduce those bugs and try and test them. Um, and also, as I've mentioned a few times, this stuff's really undocumented and is likely to change in the future. So if you work for a browser, we'd also like to talk and maybe you know make sure we can get uh, our upstream bugs fixed and uh, make it more stable in the future. And that is actually it. been using a lot of these templates called uh, unbullet list, bullet list, ordered list in wiki text. Maybe if you make visual editor to cooperate with this, maybe this solves the problem or not? Are you trying to introducing more templates to this stuff, generating stuff for us? Yes, generally true. Uh, I, I would say it's it, it anything, um, try and use simpler constructs um, than more complex ones. Uh, in visual editor editing a template, Dead in the list is only going to be harder. Yeah, in, in the sort of history of sort of media we can, um, people have had sort of feature requests that we haven't been able to fulfill, and so they've gone ahead and created the template script. And now we're at this point where, like, oh, that's made life a lot harder for us. So we're trying to sort of convert things that are currently done with templates back into being done with like, proper code. Yeah. Can we fix the wiki text? No way to represent a new line in a first. So I don't think that's really a problem because like Wikipedia has survived for more than 10 years without anyone actually wanting to use this feature and I think it's perfectly no, it's just, they never could, right? I, think, I, think sure. I mean I think it's an edge case, it's just, it's just that they're I don't think the language necessarily needs to be enriched to like make all these weird things possible. It's just that um, it's it means it's it's just it just isn't um, something that you can represent a white shell in. And I don't think it'll ever be. But um, we need to be aware of like, the edge cases where you can't, uh, where you can't wrap yourself Or we can just mm -hmm. get rid of wiki text in the next 10 years. Yeah, or yeah but, this, but that's not going to say. We're going to get rid of wiki text. We're still going to have all these crap code and visual editors work around things that wiki text is used to be from. No, I, I, think, I think the day you turn off wiki text, there's a, like, the next day you turn on a whole bunch of things that visual editors are going to say. We've always had a between visual editor before and we can be essentially wiki editor. Yeah, yeah, just to be clear, like Visual Editor Core is uh, a pure HTML5 editor and doesn't really have any knowledge of the text. 
and we and we insert all that stuff in the BDP right. integration. You know, one way you'll be able to run like a good amount of WordPress or something. So it's one of these sort of hacks that we're putting into media right here. We're trying to keep in the sort of media the extension part. I think we'll do it once in a I think you asked my first question, which is um, can I get the consent of the So it's the time yes. Yes, I'll do. Uh, it seems that you're, um, uh, for a, a great list of uh, problems and semi spec about content editable, the best thing I've got so far is your presentation. Uh, thank you for that. Is, is there anything more, for, for example, is, is the best way to go download the visual editor and there's documentation there about content editor? Um, so there is actually um, someone named uh, Arya Gregor, um, who I actually know and said really cool, um, wrote this spec for like WebWG that um, sort of defines how content editable behaves in most browsers, um, which isn't even trying to be very normative and just trying to describe what else is going on. Um, he wrote seven pages about what happens when you press the enter key. Um, so this, this stuff is incredibly complex. There are like hundreds of pages of of documentation explaining exactly how everything works in browser from this point of view. Um, these things aren't, that's not how things should work ideally in our opinion, like it's not, that's not what they should be, he's just describing what is currently going on. But um, every, all of those things, even just pressing enter, um, will trigger incredibly complex and inconsistent uh, behavior between browsers. And so copy paste, you, that's just where your head explodes. You can also like, I just want to see in the uh, community industry show that uh, uh, there's a bunch of people there who have dealt with this for a while and they have to answer questions, even though it's not just a good vision. Have you actually tried to proactively engage with the person? Yeah, we've filed upstream bugs um, and uh, we messed with people there and we put them in the um, yeah. They fix some of them. They, they, they only occasionally have someone actively working on this component. So. Yeah, they don't consider it to be GI part of the Okay, thank you guys very much.